How would you react if someday you received news on the sudden death of a family member or friend? How would you react if your doctor one day told you you've only got a couple of months left to live? How would you react if your vet told you there's no other way to save your pet cat or your pet dog? How do you respond to death? How do you respond to death? I'm guessing for the most of us, not too well. I mean, we don't really talk about death on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, who wants to die right now? Who wants to die? <laughs> Bob is an exception. For many of us, maybe except Bob, death is a difficult thing to grasp. It's difficult for us to accept death. You know, it's a hard pill to swallow. Even for the great Peter himself, the most prominent of all the disciples, the boldest, the bravest of them all, couldn't come to terms with the idea of death, especially after hearing that Jesus, the Son of Man, must die on the cross. And remember what Jesus says at the end of Mark chapter 8. We looked at this passage just a couple of weeks ago during Matthew's sermon. Jesus says in verse 31, the Son of Man must suffer many things and then, and then what? Be killed. And then do you remember what happens next? Peter takes Jesus aside to rebuke him. I mean, can you imagine that? To rebuke him? The teacher rebuking, no, sorry, the student rebuking the teacher? He's probably saying, Jesus, are you out of your mind? What are you on about? You're our king, you're our savior. You're here to save us all. You're here to deliver us. You're not here to die. What are you talking about? Don't spout such nonsense. As we have also been reminded in Matthew's sermon, everyone just seems to have some sort of preconception of who Jesus is. You know, everyone thinks Jesus is their Alexander the Great, here to deliver them all to victory and success. You know, they all look forward to the glory, the crown, the end state, but not really the suffering, the pain, the shame that precedes it. And then do you remember the lesson in Dom's sermon just last week? At the end of chapter 8 in verse 34, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and carry his cross. You see, the Christian life is not a walk in the park. You know, expect suffering, expect pain, expect shame. You know, remember the terms and conditions that Dom preached last week. What were the terms and conditions? You know, to follow Jesus means to follow him to the very end, to the very end of our life. But you see, Jesus knows this. He's aware of this. He knows that the Christian life is not easy. He knows that all his disciples will face hardship. Persecution will come for them. They will, in, they will face the hostility of the world. I mean, every single one of his disciples, except for John, died a terrible death. But even then, John died while in exile. Jesus knows there will be suffering, there will be pain, there will be persecution to come. This is all to be expected in such a sinful, broken, depraved world. So you can imagine when Jesus says to his disciples that the Son of Man is going to die, you can imagine the look on their faces in disbelief. You know, all their hopes and dreams of glory a happily ever after ending just shattered. They all feel so hopeless. Jesus, what are we going to do without you? What can we achieve if you're not here with us? You know, for them, the death of Christ was a stumbling block. They just couldn't come to terms with the cross, with the idea of Jesus dying. And you know, sometimes we're like that. You know, we all look forward to the, to the glory. We all look forward to the end state, the crown. But are we actually prepared to carry the cross before us? But I'm not here to discourage you. 
I'm actually here to encourage you because while we've been reminded that the Christian journey is not an easy life, Jesus actually gives us the assuring statement in the start of chapter 9. He says, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And you know what? The exciting thing is we get to catch a glimpse of what that power looks like. And friends, let me just say, what's about to unfold is one of the greatest, one of the most significant events ever recorded in the Gospels. You know, throughout Mark's Gospel, we've seen Jesus perform miracles here and there, but this has got to be the greatest miracle of them all. If you don't believe me, let's have a look at Mark chapter 9 together after one of the uh, youth will read for us. So please keep your Bibles open. Turn to Mark chapter 9, verse 2. And Joseph will read for us. Thank you, Joseph. The trans. The Transfiguration. And after the six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves and is transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, was as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph, for reading for us. So six days later, after leaving the disciples, confused of his death and resurrection, Jesus takes Peter, John, and James up a high mountain. Now, I mean a really high mountain, not the kind of mountains we get here in Canberra, not like Black Mountain. And it's not exactly clear why these three men in particular. It could be that they were the closest to Jesus. After all, they were... They were, you know, among his first disciples. Or it could be related to what Deuteronomy chapter 17 and chapter 19 says. It says that where truth is confirmed in the mouth of two or three witnesses, hence the three men. But regardless of what the reason is, we can assume that what Jesus is about to do is something very, very important. So I hope you're paying attention And remember, at this stage, the disciples are probably confused. In fact, they're probably worried. You know, after all, they've already made the great confession in verse 28, saying that Jesus is the Christ. They affirm who he is, but they just just don't really get why he needs to die. And so at this point, they're they're feeling a bit anxious. They're afraid. They're afraid of losing Jesus or what's to come. You know, for them, the Christ the death of Christ is a stumbling block. But knowing this, knowing this issue, Jesus takes it to the next level. He takes it to the next level. He says, watch, I will show you. Watch, I will show you and you will see. What does he do? It says in verse two, it says he was transfigured before them. The word transfigure means to change, to transform, like like a butterfly emerging out of its cocoon, like a tadpole turning into a frog, like Professor McGonagall turning into a cat for all the Harry Potter fans out there. But this isn't any ordinary transformation. In fact, I think it helps to think of it as some sort of unveiling or uncovering. 
You know, and like um, the curtains of a drama theater fold to reveal the stage, like the groom uncovering the bride's veil, revealing the face of the bride. I'm going to steal Matthew's illustration, like Darth Vader taking off his mask to reveal himself to Luke that he's the father. Probably should have said spoiler alert, but it's too late for that. And so here Jesus is revealing his true form. He is revealing his true form before Peter, James, and John. And his appearance is described as a bright light. Not just any kind of light, but a very intensive, blinding kind of light. You know, a bit like the sun. Have you ever tried looking up directly at the sun? You know, Wei Shen would probably tell you that you'll need a special telescope for that. Or have you ever encountered one of those annoying drivers who just turn on their high beam before you? Yeah, it's that kind of blind light. And I really like what Mark says in verse 3. He says, his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. You know, it sounds like he had a bad experience at the cleaners. You know, not even fab or dynamo laundry liquid could achieve this kind of white. Because this is the purest revelation of God. Now, God is, he is showing us all of God's attributes contained in him. All of his perfections, all of his glory, all of his majesty, just radiating before us, before our very eyes. He's basically telling us here, that Jesus is God manifest, that he is God. Now, I just want you to appreciate what is happening here at this very moment. Put yourself in the shoes of the disciples or sandals of the disciples. Imagine witnessing the blazing glory of Christ's divinity before your very eyes. You know, friends, this is a very physical experience for them. This isn't a vision. This isn't a dream. This is a real life experience. A life changing one for sure. For sure. You know, this experience remains embedded in their minds for the rest of their life. Now, I'll show you why. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Similarly, John writes in 1 John chapter 1 that we have that which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, the life was made manifest to us and we have seen it. We have seen it and now we proclaim to you what was made manifest to us. We saw it. We were there. We beheld his glory. Matthew records this in chapter 17. Luke records this in chapter 9 and here Mark records it in chapter 9. Why? Why? Because it's so important. It's so important. And you might ask, well then, why the vision? Why does Jesus do this? It's to anchor his disciples in confidence of the glory to follow the suffering. Did you get that? Let me just repeat it. It's to anchor his disciples in confidence of the glory to follow the suffering. Times will be hard. Times will be hard. Persecution will come. They will encounter the hostility of the world. You know, we know eventually that James was beheaded, Peter was crucified upside down, and John would be exiled. So Jesus needed to prepare them. He needed to give them something to hold on to. He needed to give them absolute assurance that he is indeed the son of God because the very foundation of their faith 
centers on the fact that Jesus is God, that He is the Son of God. And that's really the purpose of every gospel that's been written, isn't it? That you may know that Jesus is the Christ, that He is the Son of God. And so here is the greatest evidence given on the pages of the New Testament before his resurrection. Now our story starts to shift at this point because if you look at verse four, we're told that Jesus is not alone. He says in verse four, or Mark says in verse four, and there also appeared Moses and Elijah. You know, it's like making a cameo appearance in a movie scene. For those who don't know who Moses and Elijah is, Moses is the one who rescued the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt by crossing the Red Sea. Some of you might be familiar with that story. And Elijah, who is also another mighty prophet in Israel's history, confronted an evil king to bring revival to the land. You know, you can regard the both of them as heroes of the Old Testament, or one of my personal favorites, Old Testament Hall of Famers. Now, I'm, I can guess what some of you are thinking. You're probably thinking, wait, hang on. If Elijah and Moses are in the Old Testament, then how did the disciples know it was Elijah and Moses when they've never met? Well, to be honest, I don't really know. Do you know? Because the Bible doesn't really explicitly tell us. It could be as simple as Jesus told them, and Mark just doesn't record it. Or it could be through divine intervention. Bob's pointing the tags. Maybe they should have tags back in the days. Or maybe it could be through divine intervention where the Spirit allows them to recognize one another in their glorified states. We don't know the reason, but they could use some name tags, right, Bob? But regardless of the reason, we know for a fact that both Elijah and Moses are very prominent figures in the Old Testament. And now, so the question is, why did they appear? Why did they appear? Well, we're told here again in verse 4 that they're talking to Jesus. What are they talking about? Well, I'll tell you exactly what they're talking about. How do I know what they're talking about? Because it's in the Bible. Not so much here in Mark chapter 9, but in Luke chapter 9, verse 31, and I'll put it up on the screen. The very detail-orientated Luke records the details of the conversation. They spoke of his departure. They're talking about his death. You know, again, we're back to the topic of death. Remember what Jesus says in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, the Son of Man must suffer many things and then be killed. They're talking about his death. They're talking about the cross. I suppose the disciples must have thought that they're talking about the kingdom, the glory, the overthrow of the Romans, and the establishment of a new kingdom. But they're not. They're not. They're talking about his death. And that's what really the transfiguration is intended to communicate, that Jesus, Jesus must die on the cross. But that doesn't negate the glory to come. You know, this was all part of God's grand plan for his people and death will not stop him because he will come again in glory and those who believe in him will have the chance to join him to dwell in his presence as demonstrated by the appearance of Moses and Elijah. And what really struck me in this passage is that in the next world, life after this world, is that we're either with Jesus or we're not with Jesus. I'll just leave that thought with you. So now everything is going well so far. Jesus appears in blazing glory and everyone's just sort of, wow, everyone's in awe of what's happening. This is great. This is amazing. Everything is going so well until, of course, foot in the mouth, Peter decides to open his mouth. 
And so here's a lesson for everyone. If you don't know what to say, don't say anything. Don't say anything. You know the one kid in the classroom who just blurts out whatever is on his mind? It's completely irrelevant to the topic. Yeah, that's Peter. That's Peter right now. And before Peter begins to make things worse, we're told here in verse 7 that a cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Does that sound familiar? If you think very carefully, doesn't it sort of ring any bells all the way back in Mark chapter 1? When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, the same thing happens. A voice came from heaven, and here God declares the same thing, that Jesus is his chosen son. This is the confirmation by God the Father himself of Peter's great confession in verse 28 that Jesus is the Christ, that he is indeed the Son of God. So be quiet, Peter. Zip your mouth. Listen. Listen to him. Are you listening? I think it's fair to say that what they just witnessed was an unforgettable experience. You know, that feeling when you've experienced something so special that you just can't wait to tell everyone about it. For those who have been to Taylor Swift concerts, an unforgettable experience. Or they're feeling that right now. But Jesus strictly charges them to keep it to themselves. Why? Why does Jesus keep te- telling you know, them to keep it a secret? I mean, this isn't the first time, right? We've seen in Mark's gospel, Jesus comes, performs a miracle on the sick, and then tells them not to tell anyone else. Why? Why? And I think it's because Jesus doesn't want people to get the wrong idea. Remember, everyone just have some sort of preconception of who Jesus is. They think he's some political liberator, the promised king who will overthrow Roman rule and establish a new kingdom and everyone can live happily ever after. And so in order to avoid, to prevent the spread of that preconception, he tells the disciples to keep it to themselves until he has fulfilled what he is destined to accomplish. And so the disciples keep it to themselves. Finally, Peter's learned his lesson. But they just can't help question what just happened. They still have questions in their head. You know, they've seen Jesus, they've seen his glory, and after what happened, they clearly know that he is the Son of God. But but what about Elijah? What do you mean, what about Elijah? Well, didn't Scripture say Elijah is to come before the death of Christ? And if you're just as confused as the disciples are, they're actually referring to the words of Malachi, who was another prophet in the Old Testament. They're referring to his prophecy, and this is what he says. I have it up on the screen. Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Doesn't this vaguely sound familiar? If you think really long and hard, doesn't it sound quite familiar? Does it ring any bells? Isn't this exactly what John the Baptist did? Remember, all the way back in Mark chapter 1, didn't John also have a ministry of repentance, baptizing people for the sake of, for the forgiveness of sins? You know, isn't, it, isn't it the same? And so Jesus, in his response, doesn't deny what was written, otherwise this creates inconsistency. Instead, he affirms the truthfulness of Scripture by saying in verses 12 and 13 that Elijah has come. He has come. Or maybe I should rephrase it as an Elijah-like prophet has come. John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. 
He came and prepared the way like Elijah came and prepared the way. They did to him as they pleased by chopping John's head off as they did with Elijah by wanting to kill him. They wanted to kill John the Baptist. They wanted to kill Elijah. Everything in Scripture is consistent. So here the reference is actually not directly to Elijah from the Old Testament, which was confusing to the disciples and it was confusing to me when I first read it, but it's a reference to someone who is like Elijah, and that's John the Baptist. But this is all just a preview of what's to come. Now, this is just the prologue before the main act. Both Elijah and John the Baptist had a role to play in preparing for the glory to come. Everything that they have done, their entire ministry, points to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, what we need to learn from all this is that the death and resurrection of God are all assured realities affirmed by the Old Testament. And what we've seen today, affirmed by the Lord Jesus himself, affirmed by the presence of the glorified saints, and affirmed by God the Father himself when he says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Listen to what he has to say about about his death. So why is Jesus' death and resurrection so important? Why? Well, because, friends, without the cross, there is no glory. Without the cross, there is no hope. Without the cross, there is no gospel to preach. Dom will be out of job. And I'm so thankful that Jesus didn't skip the cross, aren't you? Because it was for his death and resurrection that we're given hope. That we've been given a new life and a chance to dwell in his glory for all eternity. And so friends, I now ask you the same question I asked in the beginning. How do you respond to death? Are your eyes constantly fixed on God's glory? You know, it doesn't get any easier from here. Because let me just say that the road to glory in the next world goes through the valley of suffering in this world. It doesn't get any easier from here. Because Matthew says, for the, great, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. You see, even the Bible, even the Bible doesn't deny the fact that living a Christian life is hard. And I get it. It's incredibly difficult. And I'm sure many of you have suffered or struggled in this life. Perhaps that's why you're here. Suffering is inevitable. You will experience pain. You will experience suffering, rejection, humiliation, pain, disappointment. You will experience all these things at some point in your life. Or perhaps you're experiencing them right now. You know, the Christian life can be like a roller coaster. At one point, you're all fired up for the Lord, doing all these things, and then the next day, you've hit absolute rock bottom. Do you know that kind of feeling? I've personally gone through it. I still struggle with it. I've gone through it. Peter's gone through it. John's gone through it. All the disciples of Jesus has gone through it at some point in their life. We will also go through it. But you see, what kept them going was not because of how capable they were. After all, most of them were just fishermen. They weren't super Christians with superpowers or anything like that. No, but what what kept them going was because they kept their eyes fixed on the one who actually gives power. 
the one who sustains, the one who preserves, the one who actually protects. And that is Jesus Christ. And so do you think you can be like them? Be like the disciples? Are your eyes fixed on God? How will you deal with the ups and downs of your faith? Now, what is going to change for you this week? What's going to change? Could it be by joining or attending fellowship groups more regularly? Escaping the busyness of life, the busyness of work, and just refocusing your mind on God's glory? Could it be serving others more or serving the church more? Taking our eyes off ourself, off our precious time, and actually investing and keeping our eyes fixed on the kingdom of God? Or could it be opening the Bible, praying over God's word which may help you? What is going to change for you this week? How can we keep our eyes and our hearts fixed on God? And I just wanna say personally, I've been deeply encouraged by Nerida. I'm not sure if you know of her story, but she's gone through multiple surgeries, hip surgery, this and that. She's in incredible pain. But despite all the pain and discomfort she goes through, every single day, on, not every single, every single Sunday, I see Nerida at the front greeting everyone as if nothing ever happened. And, you know, one day I remember I approached Nerida and I said, Nerida, how, how did you do it? You're in so much pain, can't you just take a day off? And you know what she said? She told me, Jack, it's all gone. It is all gone. It's through his power. You know, everything I'm going through right now in this body is temporary. I look forward to receiving the new body. You know, after hearing that, I was deeply touched. And that sort of remained with me. Every time I do ministry, every time I come to church, every time I go through something, every time I go through something difficult in my life, everything here is temporary. So why look, why fix your eyes on something that is temporary? And for those who have not yet believed, those who are just visiting or haven't really come to terms with the Bible, let me just say, you don't actually need to witness God's glory like, you know, with, through the transfiguration. Because God has actually revealed himself through his word, through the Bible. And so let me encourage you to open it, to pray on it, to humbly pray on it, and hopefully witness the glory and majesty of God revealed through his holy scriptures. And that's my prayer for today. Let me pray. Oh, Father God, I just want to give thanks, Lord, uh, for today. What a privilege it is to open your word. And God, I pray as we continue to live our lives here on this earth, that we may continue to have our eyes fixed on you for all things. And I pray that, Lord, we may continue to marvel at your glory for the rest of our life. And I pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.